I'm Matthew Rochette, <laughs> and I am having the time of my life in the ultimate Behind the Wings episode with the P-51 Mustang. BAM! I am going to try to contain my enthusiasm here so that I can talk normally during this interview, but Mark Bingham, how do you not freak out every time you fly this plane? I'm one of the luckiest guys alive to be able to fly a P-51 Mustang. I will totally agree. Now, our viewers, correct me if I'm wrong, probably know a thing or two about the P-51 and its history, but give us a little rundown on this particular plane's history, because it's pretty cool. This particular plane was built in January of 45 by North American in the uh, Grand Prairie factory just outside of Dallas. Oh, nice. And it was then commissioned with the Army Air Force in July of 1945. The war, World War II was pretty much over, so this immediately went into uh, assignments with the National Guard, and it had 11 assignments in the National Guard, three of which were right here in Colorado at uh, Buckley Air Force Base here in Denver. Oh, no kidding. See, I love that kind of tie-in. Now, everybody probably knows that this is a D model, and if you don't, this is why you're watching the series, which is great. Tell us a little bit about what makes this a D model Mustang. The D model is really the change from uh, what they called the Razorback Mustangs, which the fuselage was higher and the canopy was, it all it did was it had a hatch that lifted open, but people complained about the ability to see on the side and behind them. And so they had had success with putting bubble canopies on. So the D model was the fourth iteration of the Mustang and it had the canopy that they could move back and forth. And then they would essentially have three 360 degrees of uh, visibility so they could see enemies in every quadrant. So as a fighter pilot, that's always a good thing. That's exactly right. They, in fact, they, it was so necessary, they traded a few miles per hour to get the visibility by putting the canopy on there. Yeah, I'd rather be able to see what's behind me. Right. Um, you were saying that there's like a lot of original equipment on this thing. In, in fact, this is the youngest surviving D model Mustang in the world. There were a number built after them, but they've all been destroyed. So this is the youngest D model that still exists. So we just alluded to some of the changes from the, the B to the C to the D model. And one of those changes was from 450s to 650s. And that's a lot of firepower coming out of this weapon. That's one of the things that the fighter pilots asked for is, is they needed more firepower. And so they did go to uh, 650 caliber machine guns uh, in the D model Mustang. So another cool thing is this hard point right there, which is actually designed for bombs, but in the ETO in the Pacific was way more important for the ever-present drop tank. That's correct. Uh, it was in the effort to get to Berlin and bomb Berlin, they needed to have fire firepower cover through the fighters and uh, they needed to have a plane that would make it all the way. And to make it all the way, you had to have fuel. So you had 92 gallons in each wing, you had 85 gallons in the fuselage, and 110 gallons on each wing uh, on the hard points, and that could get you 1,200 miles into Berlin and back. Oof. One of the neat things in, uh, in Europe is the British actually designed paper drop tanks because you don't want to use a, a resource. You make a paper tank, you're gonna drop it anyway, because as soon as you saw the bad guys, you punched the tank. It's kind of cool. Yeah, the paper tanks uh, were invented. It's kind of like a cardboard with a shellac on it, and it would hold fuel for about 10 hours before it would start to disintegrate, <laughs> which was just long enough to uh, use them, and then they would drop those paper tanks off to eliminate the drag once they had taken the fuel out of the paper tank. Here's some kind of cool cocktail party knowledge. The Germans actually labeled their drop tanks with Keine Bombe which means not a bomb, because they were dropping them over their own people, and the German citizens were freaking out because they were seeing these things on the ground, and they were like, oh my God, it's a bomb. It's not a bomb, it's just an empty drop tank. Neither here nor there. Okay, so let's keep going. All right, Mark, when I was monkeying around in your cockpit, not touching anything. Of course. Um, I did notice that you still have the flare port installed right up there. 
tell our viewers a little bit about what that actually did for the pilot. Sure, so uh, right to the left side of the pilot is a hole in the fuselage and that hole allowed him to shoot a flare gun. Looks like a pistol yep. with a big barrel, like a big shotgun shell. And he would have different colors in that flare to tell uh, people at his home airstrip if he had an emergency, it would be red. If everything was okay, it would be green. Or if he had, so he needed some assistance, typically it would be white or yellow. And he could shoot that flare out so they would uh, know what his condition was if they couldn't reach him by radio. Oh, that is really cool. Now, the other thing I'm noticing is the wing on this plane. I mean, you can see every rivet on here. And normally, when these things came off of the factory line, they were all puttied over because this was what's known as a... Laminar wing. Yeah, so laminar flow is you want to get the, the air coming over the top and the bottom of the wing without a whole bunch of, of tumbling. And so they were puttying over all of this stuff, except of course for the gun bays that you got to get in and out. But everything else was just as smooth as they could make it. They, they really did that until at the end of the war when they couldn't get the planes out fast enough. Finally, they just left over the rivet tops and they got the planes out uh, into the field as soon as possible. That's really cool. All right, Mark, let's talk power. All right, so this engine is a Rolls-Royce Merlin built by Packard, under license to Packard, out of Detroit, and it has uh, 1,460 horsepower. It's a V12 engine. Oh man, what was your top speed? The top speed on this particular airplane is 503 miles an hour. Oh, nice. uh, that's if you're going downhill and that's your red line. Typically, uh, 430 miles per hour is what they would consider the top speed for operational purposes here. So the very first um, aircraft um, actually had a Allison engine, a V1710 in it. That's and it correct. just didn't have the, the superpower oomph to get above 15,000 feet where we were needing to escort our bombers. Right, so uh, that was the A model Mustang. We're talking about the D model Mustang now. And the real difference was the B model had the Merlin engine put into it, and it also had a two-stage supercharger. Yeah. And the supercharger allowed it to go above 30,000 feet where the fighters were, and that's what really made this plane uh, zing when it finally got the Merlin engine and the two-stage supercharger. So Mark, um, take me through the startup sequence on this bad boy. Okay, you have to be kind of a two-armed paper hanger to get this <laughs> done, but we start with the uh, battery, so we turn the battery on. Okay, right there. Then we turn the fuel boost pump on, and what that does is it right. pressurizes fuel from the fuel tanks up into the engine. Okay. Then we primer the engine with fuel, uh, and then once the engine's been primered, we turn the starter on. We have to hold the starter on, and that starts turning the blades around, and once you've turned four blades around, then you turn the magnetos on, so your starter's moving with your left hand. The magneto comes on with your right hand. Okay. Then you'll see a big white puff of smoke come out of the exhaust stacks and you immediately take the mixture now with your right hand and move it into the rich position. Wow. And uh, then it'll start to kick off, and in, in order to make it run smooth, then you give it a little more primer until it all runs, uh, runs smooth through the engine. You might have to bring the throttle up a little bit just to uh, make sure that uh, everything's getting lubricated with fuel. Wow, that's a... <laughs> That's a lot of work, and there's not a lot of room in here. It's pretty tight. These cockpits were made for 18-year-old boys who weighed uh, 120 pounds <laughs> and were five foot six. And they're not six foot two, 53-year-olds. All right, so it wouldn't be behind the wings if we didn't fly. Well, of and course. And I notice you got a jump seat back there. Well, yeah, but uh, I tell you what, how about I fly, and I'll tell you about it as I'm taking it off. All right, I can do that. Good deal. I probably ought to get out, though, huh? if you have to. Oh. Okay, so we've been cleared to taxi out to runway eight. We're going on Alpha. Engine's already warmed up. We'll take off on eight. You'll get to experience the roar of the mighty Mustang and uh, we'll come back and land.
and that's the shutdown of the Mustang. We turn the battery off and we turn the magnetos off. We lock the controls. And there's your flight of the Mustang. Mark, how was it? It was excellent. It was a great day to fly. Well, man, thank you so much for letting our audience come with you in your flight, because that's not something that happens every day. Well, I'm grateful I got to share it with somebody. Well, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. And we thank you guys for watching. And if you've got questions or comments, hit us up on YouTube or Facebook. And again, thanks for watching, because without you, there is no behind the wings. And I don't get to do stuff like this. How do you, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put my hand out so that you shake it, okay. <laughs> Used for, I am. Strup tanks. Yeah, thank you. Mustang, it does not get any better than this, ever. No. <laughs>